war represents humanity at its most exposed, with that juxtaposition between heroism and horror. One thing that isn't often discussed is the connection between war and the strongest of human emotions, love. War reveals that bond between brothers in arms, or even between enemies across a field of shared sacrifice, or the strength of love that can develop when ordinary people are exposed to extraordinary circumstances. Maybe it is that period of great sacrifice, or the fear that you might not live to see another day, that reminds us of what is most precious. That time when George Custer attended a Confederate wedding during the Civil War is history that deserves to be remembered. George Custer had a strange path into the military. He grew up in a large family where the siblings played pranks on each other. The Detroit News wrote in 2013, Custer had three younger brothers and a sister. It was a rough and tumble existence. Armstrong's brothers and his father, who was described as a childish himself, constantly teased and played practical jokes on each other well into adulthood. But his childhood was marred by the death of his mother, the news continues. His mother died when they were children, so Custer's half-sister, Lydia Ann, who was 14 years older, became his surrogate mother. At the age of 14, George, called Otty by his family, lived with Lydia Ann and her husband, David Reed, to attend school. He graduated from normal school at the age of 17. Otty wanted to be a soldier and attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, but there was a problem. The website HistoryNet explains, the only hitch was that Custer needed the requisite congressional appointment, but the local congressman was a staunch Republican, and the Custers, staunch Democrats. But salvation came in an interesting way. He started an affair with a local girl. Her father was an influential Republican, and he secured Custer's appointment to West Point in order to keep him away from his daughter. George has been described as West Point's worst cadet. Not only did he not take his studies seriously, but he remained a merry prankster who led the academy in demerits. Historian Hal Funk, writing in the Springfield News Leader, wrote, if he'd had a few more demerits, he would have been completely dismissed. In fact, he seemed to know exactly how many demerits he had. A cadet would be expelled if he reached 100 demerits in six months. History.net notes, Custer earned 90 citations in only three months, but managed to restrain himself for the next few months without a single misdeed. At one point, he managed to get by with... 98. Custer had more fun, gave his friends more anxiety, he walked more tours of extra duty, and came nearer to being dismissed than any other cadet I've ever known, a classmate recalled. Custer himself would later write, My career as a cadet had but little to recommend it to the study of those who came after me, and less as an example to be carefully avoided. But for all his pranking, Custer was popular with other cadets. As HistoryNet notes, what Custer lacked in academic excellence, he made up for in popularity as a cadet. Custer made many friends at the academy. Among them was John Willis Lee. A gimlet is a small tool for drilling holes, and Lee had been given the nickname Gimlet because he was tall and thin. There's a little record of their dealings together at the academy, but as would become clear, they must have become close friends. Custer did poorly on his exams, although he excelled at horsemanship and cavalry skills. He might never have graduated, given his academic record and his eventual total of 726 demerits. But, History.com explains, the Union needed officers to fight its newly begun Civil War. George Custer graduated at the bottom of his class, 34th out of 34, in 1861. The website Essential Civil War History writes, the loudest and most enthusiastic hurrah for any cadet of the U.S. Military Academy graduation of 1861 came when the name George Armstrong Custer was announced. Many of his fellow students and instructors doubted that he would receive a diploma. After all, he'd been the class clown, a prankster who had finished last in his class due to his fun-loving personality. But Custer was also the most popular man in his class. But his friend Gimlet Lee didn't graduate. A North Carolinan, he had resigned from the academy to join the Confederacy. He was made a captain of Company I of the 5th North Carolina Infantry Regiment. George Custer was commissioned a second lieutenant. The Detroit News writes, he returned to Detroit in 1861 a second lieutenant and met with Michigan Governor Austin Blair at the Michigan Exchange Hotel for approval to join the Michigan Cavalry as an officer. Detroit historian Silas Farmer noted that Blair was distrustful of Custer's flowing blonde hair and otherwise effeminate appearance, but eventually signed his approval. Custer joined the 2nd United States Cavalry, with whom he participated in the July 21st First Battle of Bull Run. 
By May of 1862, Custer joined the staff of Major General George McClelland in the Peninsular Campaign. Custer was among those brave enough to reconnoiter in the gas-filled observation balloons and among the first Union officers to discover that Confederate troops under General Joseph Johnston had abandoned their defensive positions around Yorktown, retreating to defend the Confederate capital at Richmond. McClelland ordered a pursuit, leading to the Battle of Williamsburg. One of the first pitched battles of the Civil War, a force of some 41,000 Federals attacked an approximately 32,000 strong Confederate rear guard protecting Johnston's retreat. The battle was quite bloody and inconclusive. While the Union made some gains, especially when General Winfield Scott Hancock's brigade threatened the Confederate flank, the Federals were not able to follow up, and Johnston's army was able to continue its retreat. George led a charge during the battle. The essential Civil War curriculum writes, Soon after, Custer was serving on the staff of Brigadier General Winfield Scott Hancock when the Union troops were ordered to charge into a line of Confederate soldiers at Williamsburg. The anxious Union troops hesitated. Custer impatiently spurred his horse and burst from their midst to lead the charge. The Union soldiers obediently followed this gallant one-man charge, which resulted in routing the Confederates into retreat. Custer later returned to friendly lines with a captured officer and five enlisted men. And the real trophy, a Confederate battle flag. The flag appears to have been abandoned on the field and handed to Custer by an enlisted man, yet it was the first Confederate battle flag of the war captured by the Army of the Potomac. McClellan called Custer's charge a gallant affair, and complimented Custer, personally. After, Custer was surveying the field in an area where a confused Confederate attack had been devastated by Union fire. Historian Carson Hudson of the Williamsburg Battlefield Trust explains, They had been hurrying forward towards the fighting and had lost contact with the rest of the brigade after they entered a thick and tangled piece of forest. Trying to find their way, they emerged onto a large muddy field and found themselves under a murderous fire from a sizable Union force on their left. Their commander, Lieutenant Colonel John C. Batham, ordered his men to turn and charge, but as they changed their direction and began to advance, Colonel Batham went down, shot through the forehead. His men fared no better. Moving forward through the mud, the 5th North Carolina was shot to pieces, losing over 300 men killed and wounded in just a few minutes. A 2013 issue of the Chicago Tribune writes, After the bloody assault that failed to dislodge Hancock from Redoubt No. 11, Custer joined many of the horrified but curious Union men picking through a killing field so thickly covered with fallen Southern soldiers that it was hard to avoid stepping on the dead and wounded. As he made his way across the grim landscape, he discovered the bloody form of a West Point classmate. When George found Gimlet Lee shot through the legs, Hudson writes in his 2019 book, Hidden History of Williamsburg, People thought they were brothers. Custer wrote to Lydia on the 15th. When we first saw each other, he shed tears and threw his arms around my neck, and we talked of old times and asked each other hundreds of questions about classmates on opposing sides of the conflict. I carried his meals to him, gave him stockings of which he stood in need, and some money. This he did not want to take, but I forced it on him. He burst into tears and said it was more than he could stand. His last words to me were, God bless you, old boy. The bystanders looked with surprise when we were talking and afterwards asked if the prisoner were my brother. Lee, overcome with gratitude, wrote in Custer's journal, Williamsburg, 5662. If ever Lieutenant Custer, USA, should be taken prisoner, I want him treated as well as he has treated me. Lee's wound would change his life. In a 1930 interview, Williamsburg resident Zachary Goodwich Durfee, 14 years old at the time of the battle, recalled, There wasn't a hospital or anything of the kind here to take care of the wounded. The Confederate and the Yankees were all down in a barn, and my father went down. He heard that men were suffering there, and he took his carriage down and asked if he could bring up some of the wounded soldiers to his house. His father was the well-to-do Colonel Goodrich Durfee, a supporter of the Confederacy, who owned a house in Williamsburg called Bassett Hall, named after a previous owner, Burwell Bassett, nephew of Martha Washington. And one of the soldiers he brought back to his home to recover was Captain Lee. There he would be cared for by the colonel's 17-year-old daughter, Margaret. A friend of the Durfees named Harriet Carey described Lee and another officer taken there, spent the rest of the day at Colonel D's, where there are two of our wounded. Very interesting gentlemen. Captain Lee and Lieutenant Hayes, both doing quite well. The former, the happiest soul I ever saw. And that happiness had everything to do with Margaret Durfee. Hudson wrote, By the end of the month, Lee was able to get around on crutches. And within the next two months, having secured the permission of her father, he and Margaret announced their engagement. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Custer had returned to his duties. In May, he encountered another Confederate friend from West Point, Lieutenant James Beryl Washington, George Washington's great-grandnephew and an aide-de-camp to General Johnston, 
who had been captured at the May 31st Battle of Seven Pines. When the two met, they talked for several hours, and Custer had their picture taken. In June, the dashing Lieutenant Custer was promoted to the rank of captain. In August, he would see Gimlet Lee again, the website Emerging Civil War explains. When the Army of the Potomac withdrew back through Williamsburg following the Seven Days Battles, Custer, now a brevet captain serving on George McClellan's staff, sought for and received permission to locate Gimlet Lee. Custer found him a prisoner on parole at Bassett Hall. After visiting for an evening, Custer returned to camp and received permission to visit Lee again. When he arrived again at Bassett Hall, Lee informed Custer that he was to be married to Margaret and requested that Custer join the wedding party as groomsman. The Chicago Tribune writes, The couple decided to move their marriage up by a week and married the next evening with Custer standing up as Lee's best man. Margaret's cousin Maggie was the bridesmaid. Custer said of them, I never saw two prettier girls. Custer described the ceremony in a letter to Lydia. Lee was dressed in a bright new rebel uniform, trimmed with gold lace. I wore my full uniform of blue. The minister arrived at nine and we took our places on the floor. Lee made the responses in a clear and distinct tone. The bride made no response whatever except to the first question. She was evidently confused, though she afterwards said, laughing, that she neglected to respond purposely so as to be free from any obligations. When Lee noticed that the bridesmaid was crying, he suggested it was because she wasn't married and then suggested that she marry George right there on the spot. He said George would be happy to carry such a pretty bride away from the Confederacy. She responded, according to Custer, while well, Captain Lee, you are just as mean as can be. George obtained permission for leave, spent another two weeks at the house. He wrote Lydia that he never had a more pleasant visit among strangers. They played cards, Lee winning every time. Maggie tried, apparently, to rib Autie by playing Confederate tunes, but even the tune Dixie didn't seem to disturb him. In September, he wrote Lydia, The approach of the rebel army to Williamsburg and the departure of our army rendered a longer stay dangerous in more ways than one. Lee has been exchanged, is now back again with the rebel forces, fighting for what he supposes to be right. William Gimlet Lee would be wounded two more times during the Civil War in the May 1863 Battle of Chancellorsville and then in the September 1864 Third Battle of Winchester. He ended the war a colonel in command of the 5th North Carolina Infantry. In April 1865, he was an acting brigade commander at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse. George was there too, by then a brevet major general, the youngest in the history of the United States Army. Hudson writes that Gimlet joined Ottie in his tent for dinner the night of April 9th after Robert E. Lee's surrender, and they talked of old times. After the war, John Willis Lee became an Episcopal priest, and he and Margaret raised six children. Margaret passed away in 1883, and Lee passed away in 1884 from blood poisoning at the age of 45. George Custer would have his own love story, marrying Elizabeth Clift Bacon in February 1864. He died in combat, fighting the Sioux in the June 25, 1876 Battle of the Greasy Grass. Among his effects left behind was his incomplete memoir, leaving unfinished his personal description of the Battle of Williamsburg. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.